Hey, everyone. Welcome. My name's John Hendricks. I'm so excited to pop on the Society of Illustrators feed and uh, show you a little bit about my studio. And we're going to do some drawing today, which I'm excited about. Uh, not nervous about it at all. Thanks for asking. Um, so I am very privileged to work in, uh, I, I live in St. Louis, uh, and my house is ancient. It was built in 1889, uh, and it's got this wonderful attic. And so I work in my attic, uh, and I've got a couple, couple workstations. Um, and listen, I have worked in many a basement, uh, in many a, a 100 square foot area of my bedroom for, uh, decades of my career. So to be able to have like an awesome studio uh, is really great. So let me show you a little bit. All right, uh, let's see. We've got my Quimby Mouse collection. It's very important. Uh, I got, I have a huge light table that I got from an old type house uh, many years ago. Uh, I had to cart it up uh, three flights of stairs. It comes apart into like 800 pieces. But uh, this is a thing that I've used for so many years, I take it for granted that I have this enormous light table, um, but it is, it's an essential part of my process now, especially almost all of my finishes um, start with a, a tight pencil drawing. Uh, and then I used to many years ago, like use very fine pencils and transfer the pencil drawing uh, to the final board, uh, like you can see here, but uh, really now with this amazing light table, I just do an ink straight over the pencils right to the finish. Got a Jeffrey Allen Love original over there. Josh Cochran print. There's a Sam Bosma. Oh, and a Sam Weber back here hiding behind the Dan Santat Beekle. Sorry. So this is, this is the Sam shelf. I didn't even think about that. Um... Let's see, got an Etienne Delessaire up there, Ted Carpenter. There's a Ross McDonald print. Uh, and this is my drawing area. Uh, this is kind of the place where I um, do most of the, the inking and the drawing and the, I draw with fluid acrylics. A lot of people think it's watercolor or at least I, I color with fluid acrylics. Um, and so that's what we're gonna be working on today. I am gonna, I'm gonna, I, I have this drawing that I've already made um, in my sketchbook. I'm gonna sort of embellish it a little bit. I didn't wanna do too much drawing because it just takes too long. Uh, so we'll get to some of the process. I know some of the questions people have about my work is often the, the coloring aspect. Um, so we'll get to that, we'll get to that shortly. Man, I discovered these a couple years ago. These Liquitex inks, um, pretty unbelievable, really. They're super transparent. You'll see when I put them down. They're super transparent, uh, and they're they're permanent. Uh, you know, they're not like watercolors where they don't reactivate when you when they're fully dried and they get re wet. So the same thing with these uh, golden uh, fluid acrylics. the The viscosity on these guys is a little higher um, than than these. This, I mean, these are so. This is like India ink. Um, so I'll show you how those work in a minute. So you can see over here in my studio, I've got the, the digital section. There's a Kelsey Dake print over there. That's a, oh, this is a third edition, C.S. Lewis, Last Battle, that I bought in England for way too much money. Uh, but I'm working on a graphic novel about Lewis and Tolkien right now, so that's my, that's my talisman at the moment. It's a typewriter that I don't use. It's decorative. Uh, I've got a Star Wars section over here. And then uh, I have a little enclave back here. This is my, my writing nook. Uh, <laughs> writing, writing is so painful. I know, I'm sorry if you follow me on Twitter. I've been uh, virtue signaling how hard it is to write. But I'm writing this book about uh, Tolkien and Lewis, and man, here it is. Woo! It's exhausting. But anyway, I, it's, all about, <laughs> it's all about mental uh, hurdles, right? And so I made this little space that's not my computer, that's not my drawing table. And this is like a dungeon I have to go to to write. Um, I did buy a, a replica Sting. Uh, so that's, that was very important. The, the, again, I need, I need talismans. I need amulets uh, to, to help me do my best work. 
We'll do a little shop talk today. I don't mind doing that. Uh, I know that was some of the questions that, that people had with this stuff. Um, so my to start with, my sketchbooks uh, are made by a former student of mine, Molly Brooks. She's no longer a former student. I mean, she's a, a wonderful writer, accomplished graphic novelist. Um, but she also does book binding, and I have over the years uh, managed to pull her time away from her um, <laughs> her real work <laughs> to to make my my dumb sketchbooks. Um, so what's great about this Coptic stitch that that she does um, is that it it does allow the the sketchbooks to lay totally flat, uh, which you know when I'm when I'm painting on them really uh, is nice. You know, I'll I'll start these drawings with, um, you know, a lot of these are from when I'm sitting in church and listening to a sermon. I, I have got my Holy Ghost comics in here that make an appearance. Um, but I, I really don't, I really don't plan these out. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll sit down and I'll think, oh, it would be cool if uh, I did a giant, you know, checkerboard of, of this hymn. But I, I don't really sit down and pencil them out. I truly just just draw. Uh, I've, I've been asked to uh, draw at conferences, like this one from Hutchmoot. Um, and, and these are really just extended opportunities to, to make stuff without, um, without really being beholden to anything other than just, you know, pure, in, pure enjoyment. Um, you know, and you just find something. You find a little nugget inside of a prompt. Uh, I mean, I, I tell my students it's like improv comedy to, to some degree. You just say yes. Just keep saying yes to things and see what happens. There's a Narnia one. I drew that in, uh, in Oxford, actually. I went there to do some research for my upcoming book. Oh, did some rubbings. Lewis and Tolkien's grave markers. So, you know, the sketchbook should should be a place to keep raw and risky ideas. Uh, you know, it, it, there should not be a sense of preciousness. Um, I know it may seem otherwise when there's these sort of lush drawings in there, but I truly, I, I do not stress out about drawing in my sketchbook. Um, you know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, I, I just turn the page. Um, and I've just, you know, I've got a whole... I've got a whole shelf up here of sketchbooks that, where you can find crappy drawings in them. Um, and you can't think too much uh, while you're drawing. You just got to enjoy it. Enjoyment is a huge part of drawing, which I think actually gets, gets buried a little bit. It's, it's actually so obvious that we don't even, we almost miss it. It's so obvious that if you... If you enjoy what you're making, uh, your work gets better, but it's easy to forget that. Oh, I started drawing with those uh, Posca markers this year. Actually, I stole them from my daughter. She got them for Christmas, and man, they are cool. They just draw complete. It's like drawing with a marker. I don't think I have them up here on my table. They are like gouache markers. They're totally flat, and you can draw right over the top of them. Um, they're a lot of fun to play with. Homage to this great Caravaggio. <laughs> I've yet to be thrown out of my church for drawing disturbing images, but, you know, hey, we all need goals. All right, I'm going to get going on... Uh, a drawing that I did in this sketchbook a while ago, and this is this is often a hazard of of drawing a lot. Is I have I have drawings in here that I never get to finish, uh, and in fact the 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 pandemic has been <laughs> the, I, I hesitate to even say this. The pandemic has been good for my sketchbooks. So uh, because I'm in so many Zoom meetings, I'm doing so much here at my table that I've had a chance to finish uh, a lot of these old drawings. Um, that I didn't get a chance. All right, that looks pretty good. All right, this paper in this sketchbook, uh, it's really nothing fancy. Um, it's Strathmore 400, which you can you know buy at Blick or wherever. It just comes in a pad and 
Uh, I found it pretty durable for ink. Um, you know, all the inks in this are just simple microns. Uh, the microns amazing tool. It's, you know, three bucks. It's totally archival. You don't have to worry about losing it. Um, and so when I get to a place where I'm drawing on location or at church, I just, I just have a bunch of these uh, in my hands. Uh, I often uncap three or four different kinds at once. And uh, I just don't think too much. I just make the line work. And then when I get home, that's when I sort of do the coloring. Okay. So here's a strategy for working. I make, uh, when I'm working on in, in actual uh, pigment, I work on a glass uh, a glass uh, board here. So it's just foam core with glass on top. What's nice about that is it's really easy to clean. Uh, once you're done, you just have, um, take a palette uh, knife or a, or a paint cleaner, I mean. Simple razor blade, really just takes the, the paint right off of it. Of course, this is fluid acrylic, which will not, you know, reactivate once it's dried, uh, which is really kind of its, uh, its superpower. So I'm a big fan of this. Uh, and when you're painting, uh, I've got multiple uh, jars of water here. I tend to divide my water into cool and light uh, when I'm when I'm cleaning my brushes, just so you don't get that gray soup. Uh, and you, you almost always need a clean one, right? So you got the you got the clean one, you got the cool temperature and the warm temperature. Of course, you can always you know dump it out later, but I like having a bunch of water options. All right, so with this guy, when you're working with wet media, I just cannot stress enough, get a big, get a big brush, right? The bigger the brush you have, the easier it is to do wet media. Um, you can see this is not a super fancy brush. This is just from Blick. But you can see how tight that comes. Uh, that, that is a real nice point. So I can get pretty sharp brush work out of this, uh, what is it, a 10? Yeah, number 10. So work it with the as big as brush as you can handle, uh, mostly because it just loads up the the pigment, and um, that's really that's really the secret to to watercolors. If you don't have enough pigment on that brush, and that the water cannot float the media across um, the section, so that's what prevents it from. That's why it dries in weird places, or you see the brush strokes. You just need enough water to float the pigment across the surface. So I had an idea with this. Um, this is from Psalm 121. I'm gonna finish this guy. I don't. I don't know what this means. Uh, people ask me what these mean. I. I don't know. I mean, sometimes I have an idea, but most of the time I'm really just drawing and responding to the text. Uh, <laughs> so this uh, pseudo uh, RoboCop uh, butterfly bird guy. I'm going to blend two colors so you can see what I'm doing over here. So I'm going to start with this yellow-orange. I love this color. This is just, it's like so saturated. I'm kind of a saturation junkie. I really, I wish I could do those beautiful muted palettes like John Cuneo, but I just love crazy color too much. You can see how much thicker that is versus the other stuff. So what I'll do is I'll start with one, one pigment that's kind of one end of a, of a spectrum of saturation. And then I've got some water in the middle here. And I'll make this one on the other side, right? And I just sort of make a stepped blend between the two. I didn't really make much of a color comp or anything for this. I just thought about it a little bit before I started. So this could be, this could be bad. Uh, okay. All right, now that that part of that color is done, I'm adding, while that is still wet, I'm adding this second color to it. You can see how it's 
the water is wicking it up into the other color. So I had this, let me get a little closer. I had this idea that the, that this guy would be sort of in shadow or that he'd have like kind of moonlight on one side of him. So I'm gonna paint basically an undertone here and then let that dry. And then I'll come back with a, a kind of unifying shadow color on top. We'll see what that does. Anytime you're trying to paint, in this case, what I'm trying to do is paint light falling onto a figure, but I'm using, instead of opaque, it's really easy with opaque media, right? Because you just start with the black, and then as the light falls onto the figure, you just cut out the light with, you know, um, a brighter color, and the opacity just paints on top of the black. But when you have transparent media, painting light becomes the reverse, right? You, you, once you go to black, you're never going to come lighter than that. So the darker color has to come second. So that's what I'm thinking about here is putting a lighter color on first. I'm using a four right now because of these tiny little areas that are in here on the hands um, and the face. But when I get to the body section, I'm going to use that 10. So I'm sort of thinking about this as I'm going to put a little, what is this? Snapthal Crimson. I want the suit that he's wearing to be definitely less saturated than, than his body, than his skin, at least. Got to be careful with this stuff. Carbon black. This stuff is no joke. You need like one little drop. That's it. Look, look how little I have in that. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, let's see what happens next. Um, you know what, I think I'm gonna tint that nose just a little bit. So I'm gonna mix that red. Sorry, I moved that just as I did it. Okay, I'm gonna mix that red and that orange together. And again, this is just, I'm just laying down kind of a base of colors on here. And this is sort of bizarre to work in, you, you would never work in watercolor this way. Uh, but because of the fluid acrylics, you can really you can really glaze these colors on top of each other. So again, I'm just adding a little bit. We'll see what happens when I put the shadow on it. That'll probably destroy it. Okay, next we'll do a nice big wash on the body. Now it's easy to get, oh, this yardstick I have. <laughs> this is this is my, uh, my mall stick. I think that's what you call them. So I put one side over here on my board and then I can rest my hand on it um, as I get closer to um, the surface of the paper. It's, it's one way to prevent you from putting your hand onto the surface of the sketchbook. Uh, I do use it for some bigger areas while they're drying. And also I have some of these uh, steel architectural embellishments. Um, they're very heavy. And so what I will do is drop them onto the surface of my sketchbook while things are drying. Um, and that will keep it, uh, keep it flat. This paper is pretty robust. I mean, even if you did not weight it, it would still dry relatively flat. But if you, if you have that concern of things curling and edges turning up, uh, that's, you know, that's often a, a, a solution is to, instead of, you can't really tape the edges of a sketchbook, obviously. All right, I'm going to create a warm, a warm to sort of cool neutral blend over here. So I'm going to start with this sort of ochre color at the top. Hopefully this won't be as saturated as that orange skin tone. Really got to be careful with that black. Can't use too much of it. But I want to go from that, that sort of gold warmth at the top into a kind of dirty armor color. All right, so I got that made. So 
So there's a lot going on in this drawing, right? You could easily get uh, sort of lost in sort of filling in the detail of these shapes and all the cool patterns, and, and believe me, I, I want to do that. But uh, if you know anything about sort of local versus analogous palettes, um, I, really, I really rely on um, not painting things in local color first. So I start with these sort of big, um, you know, global sort of washes to, to just like you if you were in a theater, uh, and you were putting a gel, you know, a, a light on a set, and you put a yellow gel over it, just like maybe in Photoshop, you put a layer on something and multiply it right into the background. It just has a way of, of unifying um, all the colors at once. So that's what I'm going to try to do here is... But you got to work quickly. So this is where that big brush comes in. Now, as this goes down low, um, I think it needs to get a little darker. Yeah, and those of you asking, I did not invent the mall stick, uh, the yard stick. That's, a, that's an old-timey oil painting uh, technique that I'm just applying to my dumb sketchbook. So I want it to get darker as it goes down. Now, again, this is, this is meant to be a sort of a unifying wash. I'm going to paint back over it again to sort of define some of these shapes after it dries. Again, I cannot stress how little this matters, all right? You, you just have to make the work you want to make, all right? You cannot... All, all work involves risk-taking to some degree. Uh, in fact, that's what makes it kind of fun if you're really honest with yourself like if you make original work on paper uh, and you don't have an undo button um, you know part of it is kind of the extreme sport uh, nature of of making stuff like this I got to be honest um, and so I definitely I don't like making mistakes just like anybody but I also the sort of rush of the possibility of mistake I got I got to admit I do I do get a little addicted to that. But only, I say that only in, if it works. If it doesn't work, then, um, then, I'm, then I'm upset and I, I hate everything. Okay, let's add a little bit I want more black in this. Um... So you can see I'm trying to cut around these edges very gently. I, I really one thing that is under um, discussed in illustration is the role of design and and shape, right? The 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 edge relationship of this guy. It's such a complicated scene that I need the color to really define the edge of this shape. Um, otherwise it's just going to be a little lost. Okay, let's get up here on top. We'll finish these. See, there we go. Okay. I think I'm going to have these feathers be brighter. Maybe they'll match the little butterfly at the end.
again, I, I do enough of these that, um, you know, you, you, uh, people ask me about color all the time. How do you learn color? Uh, it's something I've just said to my graduate students recently. Um, if you're ever, if you're actually in the market for an MFA, come find me. I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. We've got a brand new program, illustration and visual culture. Just Google that. You can come study with me where all we do is draw in sketchbooks and use yardsticks to paint on them. No, I was just talking to a student about color and everyone comes up with their own relationship to color. Uh, it, it, it has to do with how you work with media. Um, I, I have not been able to teach learning color outside of physical media. Um, I think that the digital tools are incredible. They obviously work well. They're obviously flexible. I think one area that they struggle in teaching is color because of the way color is presented in those palettes as the sort of gigantic high saturation wheel of, of you know, like Crayola power. Um, so working with physical media can teach you uh, color. It, it, it can give you your own relationship to it because you will have kinetic memories of mixing and of finding color and memory and learning come from kinetic action. I'm, I'm convinced after many years of teaching that you, you have to have your hands involved. You can't just read about color. Um, you can't just look at great pieces that use color. Uh, it has to be kind of a whole body-mind connection. So get a sketchbook. Get some paints, get some Posca markers, and start mixing them together. Okay, that guy is going to dry there. I need that to be fully... Oh, you know what? I should probably do that wall. But I do need that to dry before I do the next one. This is going to be much darker. I may bring in some of that. Quinecridone gold. I'll tell you, this is the, my whole career. This color, okay? Steal that color, you can steal all my clients. That color, that color has appeared in every illustration I've ever made, probably. That's actually, that's not an exaggeration. In fact, I, early on in the, <laughs> in my illustration career in the, the Audis, I remember going weekly to uh, Golden's website to make sure they had not gone under. I was so terrified that I, they would never make that color again and I would <laughs> I would lose my my visual voice. I'm not going to open the drawer next to me and show you just how many bottles I have. <laughs> no, it's not that many. But should the world end, I can make Gwinnecrenone gold paintings for many decades to come. Now, it's important you see how I'm drawing the bead of the watercolor across the page. This is not watercolor paper. So it, it, it wants to soak in. And so you have to keep that little edge, that edge of the water, pretty active. Otherwise, it's going to soak in and give you a, you know, a seam. And you can, you can learn to disguise this stuff. I tried to get my son to be my social media manager for this. He's 15. He had other pressing events. So I know you guys have some questions in the chat. I'll try to get to them in a minute when they're drying here. Okay, so I'm going to drop that guy on there. Uh, okay, so that's just sitting there to keep the weight on that edge just while that dries. All right, what else do we need to do? Oh, the visor. Okay. And again, at this stage, this is all, this is all just the... This is just the sort of rich underpainting.
So I dropped in a little of that black and let it float through that, that shape I just made. So you can think of, of working with wet media as, as drawing shapes in water. And then as long as that's wet, you can float other colors through that shape. But if it's in the process of drying, it's not going to work, right? So you really only have that first opportunity when you make that shape uh, to drop in additional colors. All right. Yes, Johnny, I see that question. Yeah, it's very exciting to put other colors on, on top of this uh, once it's dried. Um, and yes, I did uh, try to get to some of these questions here. I did, I did study illustration in undergrad. I went to the University of Kansas. I studied visual communication there. Okay, while this is drying, I'm gonna add one little piece to this. All right, I'm just gonna add the citation, which I never finished. Um, hope that's straight. Remember, a, <laughs> a confident line in the wrong place is better than a cowardly line in the, the right place. Cowardly line. Cowardly lion. <laughs> what I'm saying is if you're confident in your marks, right, they don't have to be accurate, right? Accuracy is just fundamentally overrated uh, in drawing. It's, it's it's a problem with the way we teach um, young artists how to make stuff. And we, we put them in front of a model and we say, okay, uh, draw this accurately. Copy it onto a, onto a sheet of paper. Or if you've ever watched Titanic, the, the popular imagination's image of what an artist is is the character, you know, <laughs> draw me like your French girls, right? The what does he do? He basically renders a photograph. Like the the image of of Rose is just just completely photographic in both value and approach. Um, completely influenced by the camera, right? It has actually very little to do with the actual act of drawing. And so, reproducing reproducing accuracy is yes one form of drawing, but it's really not the main form of drawing. Drawing is, um, it's an artifact, it's, a, it's an activity, and it's an experience, right? And ultimately, it's a form of communication. So I just think you need to make drawing less about being accurate and more about uh, communicating something. I'm going to spell this wrong. I spell things wrong all the time. This is Psalm 1. All right, this stuff is, oh yeah, look, it's almost, it's dry, basically. All right, let me just color this in. Now, if I went over this right after I finished inking it with uh, wet media, it would it would bleed a little bit uh, because this these microns they they take just a you know just a few I mean probably minutes really to to set and and be permanent. I've noticed the red wants to smear more, but if you let it sit twenty four hours, it's it's permanent and, and water fast. I mean, you could see that stuff on the other side uh, didn't didn't move at all. You all should read the Psalms. I'm telling you, I'm not, this is not going to turn into a religious tract, but there's some uh, pretty appropriate poems of lament in there. If you, uh, if your heart feels like it's in need of some lament, they didn't pull punches, man. I'm telling you. Okay, let's be done with that. Okay, now I, <laughs> I'm not sure how gutsy I want to be here. I got about 20 minutes left. I had an idea to do a, um, 
a blue, <laughs> a blue shadow, as in, so I, I imagine there's like moonlight coming from this side, illuminating a sort of edge of a higher saturation here, and then everything else on the other side uh, falling into blue. Um, so let's, let's try it. This uh, could look very bad. All right, so I'm, I'm over on my glass palette now, so I want to clear out some room for this blue. So I get very nervous when there's colors of high saturation together of different, you know, temperatures. I just, I, I just want to have a clean space. So I'll, I'll take my sprayer, kind of spray everything. Most of it wipes off if you need to get some of the little leftover bits. My daughter likes to do that. It's like putting glue on your hand and peeling it off. It's very satisfying. Okay, let's get rid of that. Now with this, with this blue shadow, I'm also going to build a, a gradient into it too. Um, so as the as the light falls down this figure, right? We need to think about it will prob the blue will probably be more saturated towards the top if we're imagining as the figure kind of rolls towards this wall, you're going to get less and less um light on it. So it will probably get dimmer. So I'm going to use a brown, this raw umber. Okay, I'm going to put this over here. This is that Prussian blue. Oh gosh, this is going to be a disaster. I kind of love it. The only time I do a live Instagram video on Society of Illustrators and I ruin my sketchbook. I'm never going to be invited back. Uh, I think that is too blue, frankly. Uh, I'm going to put a little of this in it. This, this is also very potent stuff. But I think it needs to be... This just feels like straight out of the tube. Um, so if I put some of this green, I think it's going to feel a little more lived in. Sometimes there are certain hues. They just, they just do not seem natural. I can't explain what it is. And you, you cut it with another, another pigment, and it, it just feels more like itself. Um, yeah, I can't explain it. Okay, I've got a very nice gradient built here. Lots of water in it so it doesn't dry out. That's another thing. If you have a fan on in your studio, it'll, it'll dry out faster. Your, your uh, palette will dry out faster. Okay, let's go back to this. I'm going to use the big brush and the little brush. So that's a 4 and a 10 that I've got. All right, I've got my stick here. Yeah, there's a question there. How do you unlearn um, drawing if you're over or obsessed with accuracy? Um, the thing I can tell you is you have to draw a lot, and this is why I teach sketchbook drawing, is you have to draw a lot, and you have to draw quickly, and you have to not care about the outcome. And boy, that is hard, I'll tell you. Uh, it's so hard to think that <laughs> you can just put some lines down and they're not going to matter, um, but thinking about accuracy is 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 most drawings that's not what it's about I, I, people are not really calling you for accuracy even though it feels like I, I know i've had students that have said you know what i need is to get better at life drawing and if i can do that then you know that's going to be the secret to me having a career um but in in terms of commercial illustration People are not calling you for, for that generally. You know, they're calling you for this, this hard to define thing 
you know, called like your voice or your, your point of view. Um, and that is much harder to figure out than uh, how to draw a figure accurately from, from life. Um, I did write a book about this many years ago called Drawing is Magic. Um, it was based off of a class I taught for years and years called um, The Illustrator's Sketchbook, and it was really about this, this very problem of trying to unlock, unlock drawing um, from the rigors that we, the sort of wrong paradigms we apply to it. All right, now see, this will be very interesting. I'm using the same color now, that same gradient I built, um, but... I'm going to do it over this other tone and see it's much more blue. I need the big brush. Now this is the point where I'll start to carve out some some shape um, using value. And again, this is not rendering, right? I, I think of this as using tone to create um, space, but it's really just it's really just two. Two colors, really. Again, this, this brush is loaded up with so much pigment that I don't have to worry about it running out. I don't have to keep loading up. I don't have to keep worrying about it uh, sort of drying out mid. Okay, let's go down here. Now, see, what I'm really interested in is can I eventually paint this lower section with most of this blue so that then that, that previous stuff I already painted feels very much like, um, like light, you know, like I'm, because of that underpainting uh, is already so bright that if I just drop in these dark values, I think I can almost... And again, I, I, it's not that I don't care if this doesn't work or not. Of course I do. I, I want it to look good. I want it to be a drawing I can show people or, you know, enter into a show or make a print of. But again, if you just make enough drawings, then each individual drawing does not become um, your epitaph. It's not going on your tombstone. It's just one of one of many drawings that you make and you, you just you're gonna have to make thousands and thousands of bad drawings in your life so uh, Christoph Neiman says that you you everyone has 10,000 bad drawings in them so you might as well get them out sooner rather than later you guys should watch if you haven't already, you probably have the abstract uh, documentary on Netflix about uh, Christoph, who is a genius. All right. Let me do the hands while I still got this tone here. Uh, let's see, I'm kind of worried about this. How's this gonna work? Just because you can render something doesn't mean you should. Less is almost always more <laughs> when it comes to rendering. I, this is the problem I have with the way we teach drawing. Like, it's just, 
in general, it's just fundamentally, it's not designed thinking, right? It's, it's um, like the love of embellishment more than the love of, of visual communication. Um, so just think, what, what am I trying to visually communicate? How much do I need there to say what I want to say? Um, let's go down and we'll zoom out on this hand. Like the temptation would be to render this whole thing um, in light and dark. And I think maybe what it needs is just mostly to be in shadow, right? If, if the hand is sort of coming out from behind... Oh, I didn't do the sword, did I? Uh, you can kind of see the superpower of these fluid acrylics because they, you know, they're they're plastic. Uh, once they dry, they're they're stuck there. I I cannot pick them back up no matter how much I try. Um, and so what that does is that gives you a lot of power to um, glaze over the top of these. See, I think that chess piece up here needs one more pass. I think it probably, I'm not going to have time tonight, but I think it needs one more dark uh, shape just to anchor it between this, um, the male part. But let's do the wall. If you're really stuck on wanting to get outside of academic drawing, um, you know, try drawing with your opposite hand. You, you've got to remove the control. Uh, that's something that I was told to do in graduate school because I was a, a control freak. And my uh, dear faculty member at SVA, Carol Fabricatori, told me to do an entire project with my left hand and... I hated it, but I um, made really much better drawings than I had made before, <laughs> which showed me that uh, it's actually drawing is really about your eyes and not about your your hands. So, so remove the control. Uh, draw in a when the pandemic ends. Draw in a movie theater without a flashlight. Um, try to draw something uh, from memory. Go to an art museum and do observational drawing, but go look at the object and try to study it as best you can and then go to another room where you're not, where you don't have that object and try to draw it uh, from memory. Again, these are all, these are all ways to encourage um, drawing as a communication tool and not as a, as a means of uh, photography, which is, again, I think the real, real problem with the way drawing is taught. Get these little doodads. Let's see, can you see that? And the thing is, if you're just drawing to draw and not trying to make uh, a masterpiece, um, you know, you're going to get more ideas uh, because I, I also believe that ideas come more from from actions than from sitting and thinking about good ideas. So um, making drawing, the kinetic act of drawing, of making your hand move, even when you don't have an idea, uh, will generate um, ideas. And so that's, that's the, to me, that's the ball game right there. 
So meaning, if you if you want to draw and you don't know what to draw, you don't you don't have a good idea. Um, just start. Just start. Don't think. Um, I tell students to make a list of one hundred things that they love drawing. And the purpose of that is for that very moment where you want to draw and you don't know what to draw. So if you just love tarantulas or, um, you know, tea parties or just make a list. Um, badgers uh, playing tag, right? It, they can be, it's in some ways, it's very good if the ideas are specific. Um and it doesn't take much to get us interested in a drawing. Um, for me, if I have one thing in the drawing that I want to draw, um, you know, I'll, I'll invest in it. Okay. Well, that was fun. Um, I'll revisit this later in the week. Um, let me see if there's any great questions here. Does the ruler help with stability or keeping the page clean from your hand? Well, both. Um, what's nice about the, the mall stick is I can, I can drop it on top of something and use that to control how close my hand gets to the page uh, and also keeps me from um, putting my hand right on, that, on the surface while it's, while it's wet. All right, I'm going to finish this up tomorrow. Probably the next step I'm going to make is, um, you know, I think, I think the, I'm going to put some feathers in here that are not going to have lines in them. So I'll probably just paint some feathery shapes in here and then let those dry and then come back and, and decorate them a little bit later. Um, I think that butterfly should probably be part of the yellow palette too. We'll see. Uh, if it's nighttime, I mean, the next step too, once this dries is I've got, so I've got two stages of, of color in here. I've got that base color, right? And I've got the shadow color. Now it actually becomes, um, it moves away from the analogous uh, problem into to local. Now you can start to decorate some of these things with more local colors. Um, and by adding Again, just you don't need to overthink color. Like I really only have on my palette uh, these oranges and blues. Um, and just by dropping in a little bit of these hues here, I'll show you. Let me this back up. Like his little uh, his little decorative sleeve there. Okay, got my mall stick. Oh, that's too saturated. I just I just need a little bit of that of that orange. And it's now the orange is now floating over both the blue. So if you start if you start locally for if you start analogous in your palettes first. Um, then in your in your second and third pass, you can start to think more local. And the reason why that's okay and that works and doesn't feel like the colors are disconnected from one another is um, you've already grounded them uh, in those other hues you've put down. So anytime you approach color, I think it's... It's helpful to think of it uh, globally, right? To, to bring the entire piece up at once and not think about, well, I'm going to, I'm going to finish this section and then I'll finish this section and it'll be completely done and I'll move to the next one. Um, you need to sort of move across the entire surface of the board um, all at once. Feels like the sword should be pretty bright. So at this point, it's really just pushing and pulling on the colors now that I've I've built a kind of ground into it. 
one thing you probably learned if you took life drawing is a really good trick is to is to put a, a 50% or a 30% gray onto the page so that you're not just working off that stark white. And the same thing works with, with colors too. Drop in that analogous tone underneath, give yourself a base. Uh, as long as you didn't go too dark or too light, you're gonna be able to kind of push and pull as you go. These should probably be Again, I'm barely putting any hue on this. It's it's just enough to kind of bring it up a little bit from that from that blue base. Now I can take the blue inside that secondary color I mean this is really sort of endless right at some point you start to wonder does this does this matter right to the to the read of a piece right at some point decorating Chainmail embellishments may not be adding, but you sort of, you sort of, after you do this enough, you sort of learn which things read and which are, again, things that actually ultimately um, distract. It's hilarious to me that I thought this was going to be a very neutral color piece, and it's already like <laughs> full of blue and bright yellow. Yeah, I mean, again, like you, I could come in here and Make his pants striped. I mean, maybe they need another level of shadow in here. Um, but at some point, I feel like it's it's doing work to distract the, the visual hierarchy from what I want people to see. Um, and so, you know, you need, you need details to be a part of your work, but they need to sit behind the visual communication task. So that's, that is the thing you always have to keep in mind. What is, what is the goal? of the drawing. And some of that becomes intuitive. Uh, you know, those of you who are watching or illustrators, you know that. You sort of figure out the the shorthands in your language that, that work and the ones that don't. Uh, you let them go. Again, this, this color palette that's been created, I did not come up with a color palette beforehand of, uh, of you know, 16 swatches, and then I mix those colors to match my uh, predetermined swatches. That's, that's not the workflow that, that I use, right? This is um, more like oil painting in that I'm, I'm glazing with color and letting the color speak to each other. And the reasons why the, the palette has a, a harmony to it is not because it's um, designed, but because there's just not that many hues in there and they are um, overlapping and touching each other. And so that creates, um, you know, a natural sense of connection. So less is more. If you want to learn how to work with color, just set some limitations on yourself. Fewer colors, the better. All right, folks, we did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Lauren says that uh, working on uh, details in chain mail is always worth it. Uh, appreciate that. I think you're probably right. All right, friends, we did it. Thanks for uh, spending an hour with me in the studio. Hope I can do it again. Uh, this was a great chance to draw with you guys. Hope you, if you take anything away from this, not to be too precious with your work, um, make stuff as much as you can. Don't overthink it. Um, carry a sketchbook. All right. See you later. Bye-bye.